Very tough. Most of us don't realize just how close we are to throwing the rock into people's skulls. We don't realize, and, and we don't realize, I mean, Jesus had to give these stories, and a lot of them we don't think even apply to us, but they often apply in the moments we least expect it. If you remember the story Jesus told of the man who had a debt, a fabulous debt, an overwhelming debt, a dollar amount that we can't put together, all of us in the room combined. And he's brought before the man he owes the money, and he begs his way out of it, and the man releases him. From the debt. That's spectacular grace and mercy. And the man goes out onto the street and meets a man that owes him a little bit. And he throws the man in jail that owes him a little bit. And the man that just forgave the large debt finds out about it. Do you remember this story that Jesus told? Why does Jesus tell this story? I think this is so that all of us in grace will be challenged to share the same grace that's been shared with us. Because it isn't easy to drop the rock. It is, it is an easy, and it's not fun. It's fun to throw the rock. In the realm of the spirit, it's fun to see people get what they deserve. I mean, we live in a world that's built on people getting what they deserve. That's a hard, hard habit for us to shake. It's a hard thing for us to realize we live in a different kingdom where the kingdom economics are not everybody gets what's coming to them. The kingdom economics is not karma. What goes around comes around. Kingdom economics is not if you do bad, you get bad. If you do good, you get good. That's not the economics of the kingdom. It's the economics of the world. It's very difficult for us to transition our mind. Our hearts have already been transitioned, but our minds have to be renewed to that day after day after day. That I don't belong in the world that I used to belong in. I belong in a world you can't see. And so my response needs to be a response you don't expect. One that you can't calculate. One that you can't understand. My response needs to be drop stones and let it slide away. Let it roll away. Jesus leaves this. And the rest of the Gospels leave this. We don't see a repeat of John 8. Any of the other Gospels. And then Jesus moves on. Again, John is not some chronological book of the, of the steps of Jesus. In fact, John is probably as much of a, of a, a mashup chronologically of any of the Gospels. This happens here, and then this happens, and some things happen just straight up out of order. And some chapters look to be, even be in the wrong spot at times, based upon where Jesus was and then where he is in the next story. And it, 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 I, I think it was not John trying to tell a chronological story of Jesus. I think it was John trying to tell the stories of Jesus that the other Gospels left out. And I personally think that John may be writing on the other side of the fall of the temple. He doesn't give an Olivet Discourse. He doesn't give the end days prophecies. I think it's because in John's world, he's already living past the time the temple has fallen. Judaism, sacrificial Judaism is gone. And John's Olivet Discourse is the book of Revelation. So what John is doing is the only gospel that describes himself as doing this is John's writing a book so that you will believe on Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke never say that. John says that at the end of his book. I have written these things to you so that you, hearing of Jesus, will believe on his name. So John is writing a book to try to convince you that Jesus is real. And so he tells stories no one else tells. He moves back into the life and ministry of Jesus and starts pulling out these incredible stories. And one of them that he pulls out is the, the, the adulterous woman. But another one that he pulls out that I can't believe no one else put in, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, is Jesus shows up at Bethany at Lazarus' tomb. Now this has got to be one of the most spectacular stories in the life and ministry of Jesus, right? I mean, we love the feeding of the 5,000 and we love the walking on the water and all of those wonderful miracles. But how many of you, I mean, we've all been at some point infatuated and fascinated with this moment in the history of the world where Jesus goes to Lazarus' tomb four days after the death and he raises Lazarus from the dead. And we, we, it's a spectacular thing. But I think that what John does, and maybe again, Maybe these events don't happen this way chronologically, but they happen this way in the narrative for a reason. Because I believe that the author, John, has a great understanding of the Torah, and he definitely has Jewish heritage. And for him, the imagery of the stone holds what it held in our introduction today. A symbol of the government of man and the way that man governs himself, whether it's in the wilderness or it's in the promised land. Whether it's David slinging a rock or J Jacob sleeping on one. And for the John stone imagery, he gives you John 8 to show you that Jesus encourages you 
to bash the brains in if you're confident you have no sin. That Jesus says you can cast rocks if you know there's nothing that needs to be cast back at you. And John knew that would disqualify everyone. And we all are left with the image of the rock rolling out of the hand of the accuser and rolling across the ground. The stone being released that accuses the woman in adultery so that she can be released from condemnation. The stone is released so that she can be released. Please hear that. The stone is released from their hand of accusation so that she can be released from the condemnation that is rightfully hers. Okay? She's rightfully condemned of adultery. She's not wrongfully accused. She's rightfully accused of adultery. But the stone has been released from the accuser and has rolled away so that she can have the condemnation rolled away. So Jesus hears of his buddy Lazarus and his sickness, and Jesus says the sickness is not unto death, which is amazing because Lazarus dies. You're confronted with the very stark reality, was Jesus wrong? I mean, Jesus said the sickness is not unto death, hangs out a couple more days, finds out Lazarus is dead, then they take off to Bethany. Do you think halfway there, Jesus was going, Father, I was wrong, I didn't think this was unto death. I don't personally believe so. I believe that Jesus is speaking a language that his disciples and most of us don't yet understand. Don't recognize physical death as death. He says, this is, not a, this is not a sickness that leaves him dead. This is a sickness that is going to show you the glory of God. Watch what I'm going to do. And so, of course, we know the story. Jesus shows up at Bethany. He's met by Martha. We have that entire resurrection speech, which is a phenomenal piece of literature. And there's so much spiritual truth there that dead people can believe. And he's not talking about people on the other side of the grave, but dead men walking around in living bodies. They're dead in their spirit. A dead man can believe in a, risen, a living Savior and have his life transported into his life. That's, that's a new covenant sermon in an old covenant world. And there's no wonder that no one understands it. How could a bunch of old covenant people understand a new covenant sermon? It'd be like you getting in a time machine, going back to Sinai and preaching the new covenant. It's like nobody understands what you're talking about because you can't, have the, you can't have a circumcised heart. God told them to have one, but you couldn't have one until Jesus. Okay. So Jesus comes along and starts preaching a new covenant message. Nobody gets it. Jesus says, watch for the glory. See what's about to happen. Go with